Hi everyone, my name is Sarah Mari. I'm one of the librarians at Portland Public Library in Portland, Maine, and I'm here today to talk to you about apples. Apples are one of my favorite fall treats. My favorites are Macintosh apples, which are a little bit more sour than sweet, which is what I like out of an apple. But I know that a lot of people like some other types of apples, like Red Delicious, or Granny Smith apples. Everyone has their favorite and they're good for so many things. So I'm going to read two books today. One is more about fall in general and one is specifically about apples. We're gonna read the fall one first because it will act as background information to make sure that we know about fall before we start hearing about apples specifically. So the first book that we're going to read is called Awesome Autumn, All Kinds of Facts, and it's by Bruce Goldstone. Awesome Autumn. This book is published by Henry Holt and Company. Autumn is a season of awesome changes. Look around in autumn and you'll see a lot of changes happening. These changes take plants, animals, and people from the hot days of summer to the cold days of winter. Days get colder so your clothes get heavier. At the beginning of autumn, you might be comfortable running around in a t-shirt and shorts. By the end of autumn, you're more likely to be wearing a sweater, long pants, and a jacket. Days get shorter. Autumn begins on the autumnal equinox. In the Northern Hemisphere, that's a day near September 22nd, when day and night are both 12 hours long. And in fact, this year it is exactly September 22nd. So by the time that this that you're watching this video, it's probably already past the 22nd. And we've already had the autumnal equinox where the two days are the beginning of, where the sun is up for 12 hours and down for 12 hours. So day is 12 hours long and night is 12 hours long. It comes from equa for equal and nights get longer. Autumn ends in the winter solstice. In the Northern Hemisphere, that's a day near December 22nd. It's the shortest day of the year. Leaves change color. Why do leaves change? To understand the answer, you need to know why leaves are green in the summer and spring. The green color in leaves comes from chlorophyll. Unlike you, plants make their own food and they use chlorophyll to do it. This green chemical traps energy from the sun Plants use the energy to grow. Summer days are long and bright, so leaves have plenty of light to make food. In autumn days, the day in autumn days get shorter. Many plants stop making food when the daylight decreases. As days get shorter, the leaves stop producing chlorophyll. The trees don't need it anymore. When chlorophyll is gone, we can see new colors in the leaves. Those are the colors of autumn. Another name for autumn is fall. But how do leaves know when it's time to fall? Some trees have leaves that can't survive in winter. Their branches and trunks are strong enough to live through the cold short days ahead, but their thin green leaves are too delicate and would die in the cold. That's why these trees drop them. Leaves have veins that carry fluids in and out of the leaf. As autumn days get shorter, the veins begin to close off. Fluids stop moving in and out. A layer forms at the base of each leaf when it hangs on the tree. And finally, this layer completely seals the leaf off from the tree. When the leaf is no longer connected to the living part of the tree, it can fall. Trees that drop their leaves in autumn are called deciduous trees. What happens to those leaves? Leaves that fall can keep the environment healthy. As they break down, they give food to the earth and to the tiny living things in the soil. Fallen leaves also act as sponges. They mix with the soil to help hold in rainwater. What trees did these leaves come from? We have ash, birch, beech, acacia, dogwood, chestnut, elm, hornbeam, ginkgo, hickory, linden, and some different oak leaves. You can also see some maple leaves, a tulip tree, sweet gums, and sassafras. Three different leaf shapes all found on the same tree. This is also a willow. 
What else falls to the ground? You might see some acorns, maple seeds, horse chestnuts, osses oranges, also called monkey brains, plant tree nuts, Chinese lanterns, honey locust seed pods, and pine cones. I bet you can find many of these leaves and also even some of these other things, especially acorns, maple seeds, and horse chestnuts if you walk around um, outside. How does autumn feel? Fluffy, bumpy, smooth, icy, slimy, spiky, slippery, crispy, soft, warm, hard. Not everything changes in autumns. Evergreens stay ever green. Evergreens are tough enough to stay green all winter. Their needles or leaves are covered with a heavy wax that helps them survive in the winter. The wax keeps the moisture in the evergreen from freezing. Some examples of evergreen trees include pine trees, spruce trees, hemlock, holly, cedar, and fir trees. Autumn brings frost. How does frost form? Frost is frozen dew, but what's dew? Air looks invisible, but it isn't empty. Air always has some moisture in it. The air close to the ground gets moisture from soil and plants. During cool nights, the moisture in the air also cools. Moisture becomes droplets on plants, the ground, and even spider webs. These droplets are dew. In autumn, nighttime temperatures can drop below the freezing point. Moisture in the air freezes into ice crystals. That's frost and it can mean trouble for plants. When the temperature is cold enough to form frost, water inside the plant freezes too, and as a result, the plant may die. Before the frost comes, it's time to harvest crops. Farmers use everything from their hands to mighty machines. Some crops are best harvested by hand to make sure they don't get bruised. Other crops are best harvested by machine. A combine is used to harvest grains like wheat, barley, rye, and corn. The name comes from the fact that it combines three different jobs, cutting, threshing, and cleaning. First, the machine pushes stalks of grain into the correct position and cuts them. Next, the conveyor carries the grain into the threshing drum. That's where the chafe, the outer part of the grain that can't be eaten, is removed. Finally, the grain is cleaned and then transferred to a truck that carries that to be milled. You can see up here, there are some apples. Lots of people like to go apple picking in the fall. Have you picked any apples? How does autumn taste? Lots of crop are, crops are ripe and ready to eat in the fall. Apples, pumpkins, pears, plums, and more. A cornucopia is a horn of plenty. It's filled with fruits, nuts, and vegetables that you can taste in autumn. What shape is autumn? Look for shapes in autumns. What do you see that's round? What do you see that's shaped like a triangle or an eye? How does autumn sound? Boo, spooky nights. Mmm, munching tasty fall treats. Honk, geese on the go. Crinkle, lay leaves under your feet. Swoosh, the wind in the trees. Hooray, fans at a football game. Thwack, a combine cutting wheat. Hiss, a black Halloween cat. Gobble, gobble, Thanksgiving turkey. In autumn, some birds leave town. Birds may migrate. They fly south to spend the winter where it is warmer and foods are more plentiful. You might see geese or other birds flying in a V. This pattern saves energy. The bird in the front works the hardest, cutting through the air's resistance. The air behind the front bird has a little less resistance, so it's easier to fly through. Birds take turns flying in the front. Here are some birds that migrate. Swans, ducks, geese, pelicans, arctic terns, egrets. The arctic tern has the longest migration of any animal. Every year, this four ounce bird flies more than 44,000 miles from Greenland to Antarctica and back again. Migration isn't just for birds. Ocean waters get colder in the autumn. Dolphins and whales also migrate following warmer water currents. So insects migrate too. Monarch butterflies, grasshoppers, and some dragonflies travels hundreds or even thousands of miles to reach their winter homes. 
Some animals don't migrate south, they migrate down. Mountain goats, bighorn sheep, and elk that live high in the mountains during the summer move down to lower, warmer lands in the autumn. Some animals don't move in autumn, instead they stop moving. Many animals become much less active in the late fall. Chipmunks, hedgehogs, bats, frogs, toads, and even earthworms hibernate. They seem to be sleeping for a very, very long time. Their body temperature and heartbeat decrease. They live off fat stored in their body. Bears spend the cold season in caves, hollow trees, or dens. They can sleep for as long as a month, but they can also wake up if they are threatened. Before they go to sleep, the bears prepare their sleeping areas by lighting them with dried leaves and grasses. These materials help keep out the cold. Animals who stay awake in the winter use autumn days to get ready for the cold. Many animals stay where they are all year round. In the autumn, they gather food while it is plentiful. Squirrels, beavers, and other mammals store food for the winter. Some mammals, like foxes, grow thicker fur in the, the autumn. This helps them stay warm when the temperatures drop. Other mammals, like the snowshoe hare and the ermine, even change colors. Their fur changes from brown to white to blend in better with the white snow. What do people do in autumn? Rake leaves into a pile, then jump. Play soccer and football. People still play baseball in the autumn. The World Series ends baseball season in October. Have you done any of these things this fall? What will you be on Halloween? Halloween comes every October 31st. It began as a holiday to bridge the light part of the year and the dark part. People always wore masks and costumes to scare away spirits from the dark world. Today, many kids wear costumes to go trick-or-treating. Some costumes are scary, others are silly. When you put on a costume, you get to pretend you are someone or something else. For a little bit. What food will you share on Thanksgiving? Thanksgiving started as a harvest festival. Families gather together to show they are thankful for the food of the growing season. Here are some of the foods that many people eat, like green beans, stuffing, cranberry sauce, pecan pie, gravy, sweet corn, turkey, Brussels sprouts, pumpkin pie, yams, and mashed potatoes. People in the United States celebrate Thanksgiving on the fourth Thursday in November. In Canada, Thanksgiving comes on the second Monday in October. Finally, the last change of autumn arrives. Autumn turns into wonderful winter. Soon the cool of fall turns into the cold of winter. Tree branches are bare. A blanket of fresh snow might cover the leaves on the ground. What other changes will winter bring? Here are some awesome autumn activities. You can do leaf rug rubbings or press leaves, roast pumpkin seeds, make hand turkeys and fall mobiles, or make geese out of gourds. If you wanted to find instructions for all of these, you could check out this book, which is Awesome Autumn, All Kinds of Fall Facts and Fun by Bruce Goldstone. Now that was some great background information. There's a lot about fall that we know now, and it can help us when we start to read this book called The Life and Times of the Apple by Charles Micucci. You can see, ooh, I'm sorry, I banged into the camera a little bit. You can see um, this book is by Orchard Books, which seems appropriate because most of the time the place that apples grow is an orchard, which we'll find out. There's a table of contents which tells us what's in this book and all of the different topics. And if we check in the back, you can see that there's some extra information as well. Let's start with the life of an apple. The apple is one of the most popular fruit trees in the world. Apple trees grow on every continent except Antarctica. In the United States alone, there are an estimated 30 million apple trees. An apple tree may grow to be 40 feet high and live for over 100 years, but it always begins with one small seed. One, the core of an apple is divided into five sections. Each section usually contains two seeds. Even though an apple seed is only a quarter of an inch long and weighs in le less than one thousandth of, one hundredth of an ounce, it could grow to be as tall as a four-story building. This is a horizontal cross-section of an apple. Fruits that have seeds in the, cor the core are called palms. Apples and pears are both palms. 
Apples are a member of the rose family. So are peaches, pears, plums, and cherries. Planting apple seeds. If you planted a seed from a big, juicy red apple, a tree might grow and it might bear fruit. But an apple from that tree would be different from your original apples. It probably wouldn't be as big, red, juicy, and it probably wouldn't taste as good. Why? Apples reproduce through a process called cross-fertilization. The pollen from one apple blossom fertilizes another apple blossom. This fertilized flower then turns into an apple that will produce seeds with characteristics of both parent apples. Even though your apple is big, red, and juicy, its seed might develop into trees bearing green or yellow apples of any size or shape. If you plant the seed from a big, red, big juicy apple and it grows into a tree, what kind of apple will it bear? If one of its grandparents was a small green apple that was hard as a rock, it might grow into that. A small green apple or a small red apple. If its grandparents was a yellow apple, it might grow into a yellow apple or a yellow and red stripe apple. If its mystery parent was a wild apple growing in the woods, it might grow into a wild apple. With so many question marks, you can see all the question marks. With so many question marks, you would never be able to predict what kind of apple would grow from the seed of a big, juicy apple. Grafting. Most apple growers want to be able to predict what type of apple they are growing. So instead of growing trees from seeds, they use a procedure called grafting. Grafting allows apple growers to control the type of apple they raise. The most common types of grafting are the cleft graft and the bud graft. A cleft graft is used by many commercial growers. On a tree that is cleft graft, all the apples will be the same. The bud graft is used mostly by gardeners to convert wild apple trees into domestic apple trees. The branches that grow from a bud graft, all the apples will be the same. So a creative gardener could grow a tree with many kinds of apples by bud grafting different kinds of apple buds onto it. You can see this tree has some red, some yellow, some green. A cleft graft, a cleft graft joins a scion, a tree branch, to a root stock, a tree trunk with roots. The end of the scion is cut at an angle. The cleft is cut into the root stock and wedged open. The scion is inserted into the root stock and then wax is poured over the cleft to pre prevent, protect it from weather and insects. A bud graft joins a bud, also known as a scion, to a rootstock or another branch. So a bud is cut from a tree, a T-shape is cut is made in the rootstock, the bud is placed inside the T-shaped cut, and the bud and the rootstock are wrapped with tape for support. From these scions, a new apple tree will grow. In both times of grafting, the scion determines what type of apple the tree will produce. For example, if the scion is from a Granny Smith apple tree, then all the apples will be Granny Smith apples. Apple blossom time. Three to five years after grafting, an apple tree is ready to bear apples. In the summer, tiny buds form on the branches. During the autumn, the buds develop and grow a covering of hair. Fuzzy hair protects the buds from ice and snow while the buds lie dormant during the winter months. Soon, leaves fill in the tree and the little flower buds appear. Finally, as the days grow warm, the blood blossoms into pink flowers. It's important for apple buds to rest during the winter. That's why apple trees grow better in climates where the winter temperatures get cold. Apples can be grown further north than other fruit trees because they bloom late in the spring. So cherries bloom in March and April, peaches bloom in April, but apples don't bloom until May. Apple blossoms don't open until after leaves appear on the tree. Other fruit, in other fruits, such as the cherry tree, the flowers appear first. Most apple flowers are pink, but gradually fade to white as they develop. Parts of an apple flower. When you look at an apple flower, you see five pinkish white petals that extend from five sepals. If you cut an apple flower in a ha half, you would see much, much more. Sepals form a cup called the calyx, which supports the, the petals. The calyx also protects the reproductive parts inside the flower. With their sweet smelling bright colors, petals attract insects, usually bees. Their broad soft shape serves as a landing pad. So this is the inside of an apple flower. So we have the pistil, the female part of the flower. It sits in the middle of the flower and includes the stigma styles on the ovary. The stigmas are special sticky surfaces where pollen collects at the top of the pistil. 
Each style is holding one stigma so that insects can brush against it. Nectar is a sweet li liquid that attracts the bees and it's found in the center between the styles. An ovary rests at the base of the pistil. It is split into five sections, just like the apple. Each section, called a carpel, contains two ovals. Ovals are unfertilized apple seeds. The receptacle is at the base of the flower where it meets the stem. Surrounding the, the pistils are many stamens. The male part of the flower, each stamen has a filament and an anther. Anthers produce an important yellow powder called pollen, and the filament is the tube that supports the anther. When pollen from the anthers of one apple blo blossom is transferred to the stigmas of another apple blossom, the ovules become fer fertilized and the apples begin to grow. This is called pollination. But apple flowers can't pollinate themselves. They need help, a honeybee. The flight of the honeybee. Honeybees, attracted by the smell and color of apple blossoms, fly from flower to flower searching for nectar, which they collect and make into honey, and pollen, which they make into bee bread. Their only purpose is to feed themselves and their fellow bees. But their travels in their travels, some of the pollen they gather from one apple blossom brushes against the stigmas of another, and that's how bees help poll pollinate apple flowers. Honeybees do a special dance to show where the pollen and nectar are. When about a fourth of the apple trees are blooming, a commercial apple grower hires a beekeeper who brings in bees to pollinate the, the orchard. Bee bread is a food mixed from honey and pollen that adult bees feed to baby bees. This is how a pollen a bee pollinates an apple flower. The, a bee approaches a flower with pollen that has gathered from other flowers. The bee lands on the petals and searches for the nectar and pollen. As the bee gathers the nectar, some of the pollen from the other flowers actually accidentally brushes against this flower's stigmas. The bee flies away, leaving some of the other pollen behind. From flower to apple. After the apple flower has been pollinated, the petals fall off and the receptacle begins to bulge. You can see the receptacle here. Petals fall off and the receptacle starts. Towards the end of the summer, the apple changes color towards as soon as it will be ready for harvest. An apple has 10 ovules. At least four of them have to be fertilized for an apple to grow, but unless all 10 are fertilized, it will grow kind of lopsided. In plants, leaves produce the energy required to grow fruit. Over 50 leaves are necessary to grow one apple. All through the growing seasons, apples fall off the trees, but most of them fall about six weeks after bloom, June drop, and shortly before they're ripe, pre-harvest drop. Sunlight causes apples to change color by causing a chemical reaction in the sugar. The reactions produce red and yellow pigment. As the apple grows, the petals fall off, but the sepals and pistils and stamens say. You can see the remains of these part in the ripe apple. And at the bottom as well. The ovary grows into the core and the ovals become seeds. When you are eating an apple, you are actually eating the receptacle of the apple flower. Harvesting apples. In the late summer and early autumn, the apples are ripe and ready to pick. Today, in the age of spaceships, most apples are still picked as they were in colonial times. By hand, apple thicker, pickers Carefully not to careful not to bruise the fruit, don't just yank the apples off the tree, but they gently cup each apple and then lift and twist it away from the tree. This ensures that the apples will stay fresh longer and that new buds will grow on the tree next year. Apple pickers place the apples in a canvas bag that they wear around their shoulders. From there, the apples are loaded into bins and shipped to markets. They use a special bag so that when the bag is full, they unsnap the bottom and can empty it into a bin. The largest quantities of apple is picked in October. That's why October is known as Apple Month. Although most apples are picked by hand, some growers use mechanical pickers, which shake the fruit from the trees. Those apples are turned into applesauce and apple juice. Today, some growers raise dwarf apple trees. Dwarf trees don't take up as much space. A grower might be able to plant over 500 trees per acre versus 27 per, per acre for some larger trees, and that means more apples at a harvest. In addition to taste testing, modern apple growers use many instruments that tell them what is the best time. 
such as a pressure gauge, a refractometer to measure how much sugar, and a computer that calculates the climate, length of the growing season, and other factors. Many uses of the apple. At market, apples are cleaned and sorted according to type, size, and color. Ideally, only the best apples are sold flesh, fresh. Small apples are those with bruises or mashed into applesauce or pressed into apple juice. Because of their taste, nutritional quality, and year-round availability, apples are used more than any other fruit in pies, turnovers, cakes, apple butter, apple bread, apple sauce, juice and cider, salads, vinegar, and caramel apples. The Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania Dutch have carved apple core dolls. Half of the apples grown are eaten fresh. Even the Romans cooked apples in recipes. About one in five apples is pressed into juice and cider. And at Halloween, which is in goblins, bob for apples. Eating apples is healthy. They contain vitamins A and C and are a good source of potassium. The pectin in apple lowers cholesterol and eating apples regularly may help reduce tooth cavities. How many apples? Each year there are over 200 million bushels of apples grown in the United States and over a billion bushels grown worldwide. The leading apple producing states are Washington, New York, and Michigan. The leading apple producing countries are Russia, the United States, France, and Germany. Apple production is measured in bushels. There are 121 medium six ounce apples in a bushel. One bushel of apples weighs 42 pounds. A billion bushels grown worldwide equals about 112 billion apples. That's 22 apples for every person in the world. The U.S. exports over 6 million bushels of apple, more than all of the apples grown in West Virginia. Most of the apples in the U.S. grow in the states that have apples on them. That includes our state of Maine. Apples are the second most valuable tree crop raised in the U.S. The most valuable is the U.S. This one shows the leading apple growing states, and you can see Washington has the most. And this one shows the leading apple growing countries. And you can see that Russia has almost twice as many as the United States. Apple varieties. Here are some of the varieties of different apples. There are almost 10,000 kinds of apples, but only a few are raised commercially. In the United States alone, half of the apples are delicious, golden delicious, and mac. These are red delicious, golden delicious, macintosh, they had some interesting names in colonial times like Winter Banana, Melton Mouth, and Westfield Seek No Further. Wine Snap were uh, apples that were grown by early pioneers for, for cider. Gravenstein apples are thought to have uh, originated in Germany. There are also Granny Smith, Rome Beauty, Cox's Orange Pippins, Cortland, Newtown Pippins, New York Imperials, Jonathan, Rhode Island greening, and all of the apples on this page are domestic apples. There are also about 30 kinds of wild apples in the world. They tend to be small and sour, but birds love them. An apple timeline. Apples have been growing in the earth for over two and a half million years. People of prehistoric times ate wild apples they picked from Asian forests. Later in the Stone Age, lake villagers in what's now called Switzerland started preserving apples, thus making it possible for people to eat apples all year long. Apples were once grown only from seeds. In the 4th century BC, the Greek, uh, BC, e, the Greeks started grafting apple trees. When ancient Rome expanded its empire, it spread the technique of grafting across Europe, including England. As English gardens flourished, so did the apple. It was natural that when co colonists came to America, they brought apples and apple seedlings with them. You can see um, the apples then moved across, west across America. And there's also the legend of Johnny Appleseed, who was a real person that was born in September, on September 26, 1774 in Leominster, Massachusetts. His real name was John Chapman, and in his 20s, he moved to western Pennsylvania and started planting apple seeds. For 50 years, he planted apple seeds in the Ohio Valley. He showed people how to 
care for apple trees and they took his knowledge westward. He journeyed all over the United States to tend his, or his orchards, even in winter. Some people say he wore a tin pot as a hat, a coffee sack as a shirt, and carried his seeds in a leather bag. He didn't like to sleep indoors and preferred to sleep under the moon and stars. An apple has come a long way since prehistoric time. It has earned its place in world history, but the story of the apple doesn't stop here. Each spring, billions of little apple buds across, across the globe adds up to new chapters in the life and time of the apple. So, I hope that you enjoy an apple um, sometime this fall. I know that I have already had a few really great Macintosh apples and I can't wait for some more. It was great to read f uh, for you and I hope that you learned something new about apples. Once again, my name is Sarah Mari. I'm one of the librarians at Portland Public Library in Portland, Maine. And I hope to see you again soon. Bye.